Good morning. <laughs> As you know, I start with the kids over in Sunday school, and I, I made a, a wise choice today. I asked them as we were getting together, uh, tell me something that scares you. And we were off to the races. <laughs> Everybody likes a good fright. <laughs> and I just lived out one of my fears, being late for worship. <laughs> Would you pray with me? All along, Lord, they've been singing these words, and I'm stepping in. All along, we've been searching for you, and and help us now to realize that uh, in our searching, we can find, and in our searching, we are found, found by the one we've always been looking for. In Jesus' name, amen. We have been talking for a month now about the idea of finding the icons in our lives, bringing them front and center, taking the idols in our lives and helping them to retreat into the background. And so we come to this final week, and it's really kind of a a simple final exclamation point on the series. How do you find things in the world today? Now, it strikes me that the notion of searching for something seems pretty basic. We all know, remember when you were a kid, you, you've lost something in the house, and you have to go through a process of searching for it. And if you think about it, if you lost something today, you would probably go through the same process of searching for it again. I guess maybe there are some things in this world that are kind of universal. Searching never really ever changes. Or does it? The notion of searching has undergone a revolution in the modern world. And uh, if you don't believe me, well, just take a look up on the screens for a few seconds. Honey, what are you doing? We gotta go? It's dressed like a president day. I'm supposed to be Martin Van Buren. Who? Martin Van Buren. Google? Martin Van Buren. Poor little girl, someday she's going to be a grown woman and she's going to be looking at that commercial going, oh. Searching has become a revolutionary exercise. Once upon a time, you know, if I wanted to find out where somebody lived, I'd reach out and I'd grab one of these. As a matter of fact, I was watching probably about a month before Christmas, that great movie, All the President's Men, about the Watergate experience. And they were showing just in that scene, and it made me smile, a brief scene in that movie where the two reporters, Woodward and Bernstein, were trying to track down a person who lived in Minnesota. And they went into an enormous room at the Washington Post office where they had every phone book in the country. And they started searching through phone books. And that's how they spent a whole day searching for a whole day to find somebody's name. What do you and I do today? We pick up the phone, go to our White Pages app, and there we have it. Or we Google. The world has changed. Do you remember not so long ago when you and I, probably maybe when we were kids, we'd have a bunch of these on a shelf somewhere in the house? No longer. Now we have this. No guarantee it's as accurate as the Encyclopedia Britannica, but we get all the information we need right there. The notion of what it means to search in this world has undergone something of a revolution. And the revolution is really very simple. It's not a lot of work to find stuff out anymore. I can, like when I'm preparing a message, say, hmm, I seem to recall I've I've seen a commercial somewhere about searching. Type it into my Google search engine, boom, 
there's the third item in the list, pull it down, ready to go. The world has changed. Searching isn't what it used to be. We've sort of, we've lost, we've lost the experience of actually searching in an ongoing process of hunting for something. And what that causes for us is we've lost the ability, I think, to understand what it's like to search for the icons in our lives. Now, just to recap one last time, idols are the things that draw us away from God. Icons are the things that draw us toward God. Well, our whole goal has been to maximize the icons in our life, the activities, the experiences, the relationships, and yes, the things that draw us closer to God. But if you've forgotten how to go about searching in this world, how do you find them? We've got to learn again the process, the steps, if you will, of searching for something. And Jesus has a brief little story for us. It's just three verses long. It comes to us from the 15th chapter of Luke, excuse me, And it's like a lot of his stories, it's embedded in a whole collection of stories. This one is about a woman. She's lost a coin. But in the process she goes through, we discover, once again, how to go about searching. Luke 15, verses 8 through 10. Or what woman... Having ten silver coins, if she loses one, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it. And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice, for I have found the coin that I lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. She gives us the pattern for searching. As a matter of fact, since the story comes to us from Jesus, we can say God gives us a pattern in our lives to be searchers, to be pushing through to find something. Look again at the opening verse. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently? Now, if you and I have a silver coin in our pocket, a dime, and we're standing in the kitchen, and we pull the change out of our pocket, and the dime falls loose, it hits the floor, and it starts rolling, and we see it roll under the refrigerator, we look at the refrigerator, and we say to ourselves, well, when I move, the next guy will be a dime richer, right? It's a dime. But she's got 10 silver coins, This is 10% of her value. And a silver coin back then was pure silver. It meant something. This was valuable. So too with the icons in our lives. We are surrounded by so many idols in this culture in which we live. When we can have something that we can latch onto that draws us toward God, we don't want to lose it. It's a rare thing. So we've got to be like the woman when her coin drops. She lights a lamp. She's not going to miss a single dark corner of the house. She goes into the closet. She gets out the broom. She starts sweeping methodically through the house, backwards and forward until she bumps up against it. In short, she seeks diligently. That's the pattern we need to have in our idolatrous culture with so many images and so many activities that can push us away from God, that's the attitude we have to have if we want to brush up against the divine. We've got to seek. And there are a couple of components to that. First of all, go everywhere. She didn't say, well, I'm going to stand here in the center of the kitchen with my broom, and I'm going to sweep everywhere I can reach. And if it rolled that far, well, eh, forget about it. She started moving. She went backwards and forward. She covered every square room, every square foot of that house until she found the coin. Look everywhere for the icons in your life. 
A lot of us, I dare say, have things like that beautiful cross up there in the center pedestal, hanging somewhere in our house. Most of us, I dare say, have a book like the one over there on your right that says Holy Bible somewhere in our house. But if we've just got a few things that sort of vaguely remind us about God when we're walking out the door and we catch them in the corner of our eye, are we really looking everywhere for the things that draw us to God? Or are we just looking past them? Looking everywhere means looking everywhere. When I wake to a new day and I open my eyes, do I look around? to the relationship that draws me in. When I go about my, my busy day, do I ever pause to take in the beauty of, of God's grandeur and get drawn into that divine relationship? As I move through my day and I touch spaces with all of my various relationships at work, at home, school, wherever it is, do I look at those relationships as something I'm just kind of going through the motions with? Or do I, in the connecting with another, look for the opportunity to connect with the divine? To be drawn in. Every aspect of our life has the potential to be iconic for us. We've just got to look at it. Look diligently. And along with that, we've got to be a people who understand you never give up. Don't ever give up. The comedian Richard Belzer, he does kind of observational comedy. I heard him say one time in a routine years ago, he said, have you ever heard anyone say to you, how come is it when I lose something, it's always in the last place I look? Have you ever heard that? To which Richard Belzer responded, of course it's in the last place you look. Once you find something, you don't keep looking for it, do you? We, my friends, we are the ones who keep looking for it. Don't give up looking for your icons in your life. Because the icons that you have here and now, the things that draw you here and now to the presence of God, as you shift through the timeline of your life, those things are going to shift with you. <coughs> So something when I'm 24 years old that draws me to the presence of God is probably very, going to be very different than the thing that draws me to God's presence when I'm 50 years old. Case in point, my life. I remember the first time I got to head out there to the Rocky Mountains. And I said, this is it. I went hiking up a, a high mountain, got just kind of immersed in the scale of the terrain, looked around at the peaks, felt the presence of God. Mountains for me are iconic. They draw me into God's presence. But times change. And so a few years later, I meet Sherry, and a few years after that, along come, well, <laughs> along come kids. Not so much time for the mountains now. I could either be a person and say, well, there goes my icon slipping backwards through the history of my life by, or I could recognize that in each moment and each relationship of my life, there are opportunities to connect with God, to find the icons that draw me in. Three young boys, seeing the way they matured, the way they grew, the way they developed. They became new icons as I saw God reflected in their lives. The icons shift over time. And you and I can't simply say, well, I put the cross on the wall at my house, I'm done. No. Look for them everywhere. Keep looking for them throughout the journey of your life. I remember a, a final point about this, too. When the boys were in around second grade. I think Ben was third and the twins were first. We got to take them back out to the mountains. So I was going to mix my two icons, my, my love of the mountains, my wonderful sons. And I remember we started out at west and we eventually ended up in the Black Hills. 
And I got up early the first morning when we were in a mountainous terrain. I said, come on, guys, let's go climb a mountain. So while Sherry was sleeping in, we put the two-way radio by her bedside, and I took one, and we started scrambling up a mountain. Now, it was not as tall. It was not as steep. It was not as craggy as that one. But it was tall enough, it was steep enough, it was craggy enough that it gave us the experience. And we got to the top and we kind of swung our legs over and let them dangle down one side. It was a, it was a safe climb. And then we got on the two-way radio. I had taken two of the icons of my life, my sons, the mountains. I had merged them together. We called Sherry and we said, hey, come outside. And she said, where are you over the radio? And I said, look up. She looked up. She had some iconic words to share with me when she looked up. <laughs> no, actually, she was thrilled for her sons, and she held her breath until we got back down. But it leads me to the next point. Look for them. Keep looking for them throughout your life. And then once you find the things that you truly love in this world, share them. Share them with all around you because everybody needs things that draw us closer to God. We all hunger for those things. We need them in our lives. Otherwise, the idols come washing over us and they just wash us away. So Take the icons of your life and share them with the ones you love and with everyone you meet. Now, truth be told, when you do this, you run a little danger, don't you? And the danger is this. If there's something you're really passionate about, let's say, I don't know, let's, let's, say, um, let's say at the NFL, Super Bowl's just over, and so everywhere you go, you start sharing your passion with somebody, and everybody who sees you knows that within two minutes of talking to you, you're going to be telling them the latest news from your favorite football team in the NFL. Pretty soon, you might run into a situation where all of a sudden people find excuses to get away from you. It's not about just sharing your passion. It's about sharing the things that draw you to God, that particular passion. It can happen even, even to the best of us. Share the things you love. There's, a, there's a, a, a wonderful moment in the scripture when the woman finds the coin. What does she do? Having found it, she calls together her friends and her neighbors then it goes on and says, hey, everybody, rejoice with me. I've found my lost coin. So next time a dime rolls under the refrigerator at the parsonage, if you get a phone call from me saying, come on, rejoice with me, don't think I've gone crazy. Just remember, we're called to share the things that move us toward God. Though, even though, they can at times overwhelm us. There's a delightful story from history about the founder of the Protestant movement, Martin Luther. That's him in the center of your screens up there. Luther recognized himself as a leader of this new Protestant movement. He thought he was pretty good at organizing and managing this early starting movement, but he recognized his shortcomings as well. He said to himself, you know, I'm a terrible theologian. That is a guy who thinks about and puts together a structured philosophy for understanding who God is. Got that? He knew he wasn't a good theologian, but he knew a good theologian. His friend Philip Melanchthon, that's the other guy on the screen. And he said, Phil, come on over to Wittenberg where I'm establishing this Protestant movement and teach us systematic theology. McLanchthon went on not only to do that, he wrote the great Augsburg Confession. He gave us a lot of the foundational teachings that are still central to the Protestant Reformation, including for our Methodist movement. But there was one little hitch in his life. He was obsessed with theology. Theology moved him closer to God. It didn't do the same for everybody. Luther actually writes in one of his journals that he saw at one point Melanchthon coming through the door, and whenever he would show up, Luther knew that it would end into a two-hour discussion about the divine nature of God, and Luther would be fighting to keep his eyes open. And one day he saw his friend Melanchthon coming through the front door, and so he got out the back door before he could see him. Now there's a tragedy in that. Somebody's got a passion about the things that draw them close to God. 
isn't there some sense of obligation on us to listen and to lean in, to share that passion? Luther eventually figured out how to do it with his friend Melanchthon. He found one of the things that drew him closer to God. And so one day when Melanchthon came to see him, he said, Martin, you and I are today going to discuss the governance of the universe. Luther just replied, Philip, how about you and I today go fishing and leave the governance of the universe to God? And that's what they did. Luther loved to fish. He loved it so much that he actually later in life leased a fish farm so that he could go there and put a line in the water and just relax. He was one of those guys who sat there and watched the bobber. I don't know if they had bobbers back then or not. But he would watch the bobber, and he was obsessed with just enjoying the fishing. Isn't it imagining what you can do with Photoshop these days? I have a Lutheran friend I'm going to send that to later. It was the thing that drew him to God's presence, like the mountains for me or my sons. He shared it with his friend. And they found that when they could sit and fish together, then they could have long discussions about the governance of the universe and God. And both of their passions, both of their icons were being lived out. What are the things that connect you with the divine? What are the things that draw you in? Share them. We all need that. And here's why. I mean, we've talked about our icons. This is the fifth Sunday now. But have we asked the why of we need icons? It's really kind of a unique thing. If we realize that we need icons in our life, that we need things that draw us closer to God, then what we're realizing is that we've lost something. We've lost the relationship with God. You see, icons draw us to God. The implication of that is we're lost. We're all there. We all have our own complete lives with the people we love and care for. But we're also missing something. We're missing that thing that causes the soul to expand, that leads us to a place where our lives desire to serve others rather than to be for the self. We're missing the thing that grounds us in our relationships and then lifts us up. Sometimes it it takes a lot to help us see it. Jim Moore in his book, Some of the best things are just so true, they've got to be true. Isn't that a great title? Tells the story of a monk who's walking along the seashore. And he's walking along, he sees some oysters and he sees some clams. And, you know, being a poor monk, he doesn't really have much to eat. So he starts gathering them up and putting them in his bag. And he's going along, he cracks open the shells and, you know, he eats them whole and live. It's uh, something people who love seafood do. And he comes along and he cracks open one of the oysters and he's about to slurp it down. And he looks and he sees a pearl. Now they tell you that only one in a hundred oysters has a pearl. And only one out of a hundred of those oysters that has pearls has a good sized pearl in it. This was a magnificent pearl. And the monk couldn't believe the blessing he'd just received in this pearl. So he kind of washed it off in the salt water and he put it down in in his bag And he continued on, and shortly he comes across a a poor beggar man. And the beggar man comes up to the monk, and he says, I'm hungry, do you have anything you could share with me? And the monk opens up his sack, and he starts ruffling through it. And the beggar man doesn't wait a second. He just starts, you know, he's looking down in and see what kind of food. And the monk starts offering him, you know, oysters and clams, the things he's collected from the seashore. And the beggar sees it. The pearl, right down in the bottom of the bag. Would you share that with me, says the beggar. And without hesitating, the monk reaches down, pulls out the pearl, places it in his hand, and says, it's yours. 
and he continues on his journey. He's going on the way along the lake shore or the seashore for a, a couple of hours, and all of a sudden he hears a voice behind him. It's the beggar man running to catch up with him. And the monk thinks to himself, I wonder what this is about. And he comes to a stop, curious about why the guy is running after him and also wondering what else he wants from him. And the beggar man walks up to him, catches his breath, and he says, I have something else I want to ask you to give me. What now, says the monk. And the beggar man grabs his hand and he places the pearl in it and he closes it in the monk's hand and he says, give to me the thing that enabled you to so freely give me that pearl. That's what we need. That's what we're lacking. That thing, that divine spark, that connection with the presence of the Almighty that leads us to a place where we just give away God's presence. So search for it. Search diligently. Look everywhere. Understand that when the icons are found, share them. But finally this, realize the reason why you're finding the things in your life and making the centerpiece of your life, the things that draw you to God, is because you're missing something. That divine spark that makes you want to give it all away. Amen.